Hi, this is Pat Morin. We are live at Google Cloud Next 2022 at the beautiful new Google building in Pier 57. And I'm here with my co-host, Daniel Newman. Daniel, how are you, my friend? Doing well, buddy. I'm doing well. And I'm excited to be here. These conversations today have all been great. And we're going to have another one. I have to tell you what, I am super excited for this one. I barely need to introduce our guest, Vince Cerf, co-architect of, yeah, the internet here to talk about innovation now at Google oh, Cloud. How wait, wait, did I hear that right? How on earth did somebody hi hire you to be here? This is amazing. Actually, this was very easy. I sent a note to Eric Schmidt in 2005 and said, Eric, do you want some help? He sent a note back saying, yes, that was my job interview. <laughs> that that's, by the way, uh, very expected from, from our point of view because it's not like you wake up every day. Every, you know, there can only be so many co-inventors of, 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 the, of the internet here. And I know, I know maybe you don't describe yourself as that, but everybody has heard of you. And so thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, believe me, I enjoy these conversations. They allow me to explore ideas, so let's have at it. Excellent. So, so let's start from the beginning. Let's go back to, you know, you basically helped find, you know, the internet's not new anymore, by the way. So, you know, um, you've been around, you've been doing this a while, you've been from the kind of the onset of the internet, and now you've been involved in the, the sort of the onset of the cloud. So we're here, Google Cloud, Google Cloud Next. Right. Talk a little bit about that, the journey, and talk a little bit about what excited you that you heard today in terms of how you've been watching this it'll proliferate. This, this is sort of like, uh, describe the universe in 25 words or less. You got like Give two three minutes. examples. Yeah, you, got, you got like right? two minutes. No, no, you take your time. So, well, look, if I uh, take you all the, way, all the way back to 1969 with the ARPANET and the experiments in packet switching, that was a heresy at the time, but our uh, purpose was to connect different brands of computers together so that the people using them could collaborate and yeah. share their computing power and their results. Then we realized, you know, this stuff might work for command and control. So then we said, okay, how do we do that? And we realized that uh, that meant that some of the computers would be in aircraft and ships at sea and mobile vehicles. And all we'd done up till that point was to connect computers together with dedicated telephone circuits. So the tanks run over the wires and they break and the ships get tangled up and the airplanes never get off the tarmac. So we had to do packet radio and packet satellite. So now we're up to 1973, we're trying to figure out how the hell are we going to do that and make all the different networks look like they're uniform. That was what led to the TCP IP protocol suite, followed by a bunch of implementation, followed by in 1990, well actually 1989, the beginnings of the World Wide Web work from Tim Berners-Lee. 91, he releases the first version. 93, the Mosaic guys from uh, the National Center for Supercomputer Applications released Mosaic. Everybody sees that yeah. and says, wow, the internet turns into a magazine, formatted text and imagery. Jim Clark sees that from uh, Silicon Graphics and says, this is a big deal. He drags them back, starts Netscape Communications in 1994. They go public in 1995. The dot boom is on, and I'm at MCI building two internets for them. Uh, and you know, it just keeps going from there. And here we are today. All of that is a consequence of people willing to try stuff out that might not work. And you have to be given the opportunity to do that. And Google is really good at giving engineers a chance to try something out that might or might not work. Oh, and by the way, if it does work at a better scale, because everything we do seems to end up having to scale up by 10x. Gosh, I appreciate the history lesson, and sh uh, I guess I was born for all of that, by the way. And in fact, uh, you and my father-in-law may have worked together uh, at MCI. No kidding. And Andy was at Bell Labs. We'll talk in the green room uh, about that, but it is incredible how a, a public and private partnerships have made this happen. And, and I'm sure you've seen this, a lot of the public private research has gone away and only a few companies uh, like Google is able to be able to do that research to come up with the literally the next uh, big thing. Now, here at Google Cloud Next, you know, we're talking a lot about how Google solves today's problems in the cloud. Um, but the great part is, is you're thinking a lot about the future of the cloud and I'm curious what are some of the bigger challenges for the future of the cloud 
and how does Google approach that? Okay, so first of all, uh, reliability and scale are huge challenges. Resilience, huge challenge. Uh, arranging for isolation of the people who use the common resources of the cloud, huge challenge, which is why confidential computing and now confidential workspace have been introduced into the mix in order to give people not only the feeling, but the reality of isolating and protecting themselves and their data yeah. from inappropriate access. So those are big challenges that uh, we have to meet. We also are noticing that there's more heterogeneity coming in computing now. I mean, remember wrist chips and how important they yes. were? They had a reduced instruction set and they ran you know, like hell. Uh, in fact, the chairman of the board of Google uh, it was one of the inventors of wrist chips, John Hennessy. And one of our other employees, Dave Patterson, who was at Berkeley at the time, was the other inventor of the wrist chip stuff. So we believe in hiring people with a track record. So, so those are big challenges that we have to face. And I'm seeing this thirst for uh, sort of standardization and commoditization where we can to yes. get you know to get interoperability and then a great desire to take advantage of unique resources so for example the, uh, the uh, tensor processing units or special purpose processors like gpus That's right. or someday qpus if we can get quantum computing uh, at a scale where it actually works so i'm really excited about this it feels like in, here we are in the third decade of the 21st century and it feels like it's just the beginning of stuff that we can do in this collaborative and aggregated environment. Isn't it amazing? Like the, I like to look at it as an accordion where history is repeating itself, right? We, we aggregate, we disaggregate, we aggregate, we disaggregate, yep. right? Yep. I mean, because, gosh, 40 years ago, uh, 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 companies like DEC and IBM still uh, were building very monolithic, their own designs, doing right. their own technologies. And then uh, Intel came along with x86, Moore's Law, but guess what? We're having trouble keeping up with Moore's Law, so heterogeneity is yes. back in style. It is, absolutely. And vendors are doing their own semi-silicon. And by the way, uh, gosh, okay, w I'm going to move this interview <laughs> along here. I love chips, Daniel loves chips too. Absolutely, I, I, I could think of <laughs> Uh, another 30, 45 minutes we could just spend on that topic right now. Exactly. Plus we've got a kind of a bit of a pioneer here. I do want to just take a, like a 20 second jog back to the earlier part of our conversation. I just want to say, you said something about, you know, allowing people to fail. And I, I, I think that's amazing. And putting that on the record that you're at a company that actually uh, does the fast fail thing for real, you know, it's been a really popular TED talk and it's been a really popular, you know, uh, in, in articles in Forbes and Fast Company, but that is the real world example of companies that kind of need to say, hey, we're going to take a big risk, we're going to try something, and we're going to either build it to be a hundred times bigger, or we're going to scrap it. And well, most companies well, never do so, that. So that, let me do a tiny little reset here. We don't try to train everybody to fail. That's okay. not what we do. <laughs> We do Noted. not do that. Noted. No, 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 I, no, I, I wasn't timeout. suggesting no, that. I just think uh, you allow it. So, yeah. no, we, we actually hope that everyone will succeed, but we want to give them the freedom yeah. to try things out. You know, it's funny. In science, sometimes you learn more from an experiment that doesn't work right. than you do from the one that does. I mean, a classic example of this. Guy's got this theory, right? And he figures out, okay, I'm going to do an experiment to test my theory. And he's got this chart and he predicts what all the results are. Then he starts doing the measurement and they come in there and it's perfect, it's matching up exactly right, and then there's this measurement over here. Now, there are two kinds of scientists. One of them says, eh, measurement error, and ignores it, my theory is perfect. The other guy looks at this and he says, huh, that's funny. And he gets the Nobel Prize when he figures out, what's right. that doing here? So we want people to try stuff out. We would love it to work all the time, but we accept that we may learn a lot from things that don't work. But all that AI and ML has taught you probably something about Probability. I mean, you do call it big query. Um, the the all right. So let's end uh, on a big idea. So, if, am I mistaken in reading that you're sort of working on an interplanetary internet? So there's a big yes. idea. Uh, tell us about it. And is it going to succeed? So do you remember that in 1997 we landed on Mars for the first time in 20 years. So the Viking lands in '76. Nothing works for the next 20 years. 
Pathfinder lands in 97. Yes. And I'm, I go nuts. I go out to the Jet Propulsion Lab, and we meet and we say to each other, what should we be doing then that we're going to need 25 years later? And so we said, we need an interplanetary backbone network in right. order to support manned and robotic space exploration. So we've been developing that for the last 20 plus years. We have prototype stuff that's been running on Mars and the orbiters and the routers, or the rovers, uh, since 2004. We're on the Artemis mission uh, to return to the moon. We've standardized the protocols, which are not TCP IP, it turns out. I wish they could have been, but it turns out the speed of light is too slow. <laughs> And, you know, Mr. Einstein says you can't do anything about that. So we've developed a new suite of protocols for that. Here's the thing that I'm really excited about. We are right at the cusp of commercialization of space outside of just near-Earth space with low-Earth orbiting satellites, which are already a big deal. I mean, pretty soon you won't be able to avoid access to the Internet, thanks to Elon and his... Uh, Starlink and the other guys who are doing the same thing. But we're going off planet at the, and it's going to be important to have commercially available communication capability. Even the Artemis missions are contemplating the possibility of, of commercial mining on the moon. So think about the implications of that. I mean, what if there's a dispute? What are the governance rules and in which jurisdiction will you manage that? And, you know, your head is, just, mine anyway, is just boiling with all these non-technical questions right. in addition to the technical ones. But we're, we're right here in 2022 ready to harvest that cusp uh, and change. So it's like chapter two of a much longer science fiction story. Do you really have to get to uh, a talk in a few minutes? Because I could sit here about uh, two or three hours and talk about this, but no, seriously, uh, my brain has increased in size listening to, to this talk. <laughs> and what I love though, it wasn't just about technology, it was the application of the technology um, in the, in, you know, on the moon, inside of our solar system uh, and beyond. I think that's really cool and it's something that I know I'm going to want to be following along the way. So, I mean, Vint, what, what can I tell, what can I say? Thank you for coming on the show. I'm so impressed you're in the game and keeping bringing, I mean, your big ideas and quite frankly, there there's importance, I think, at, at companies like Google uh, for history. And not that history always repeats itself, but a lot of the times you can keep from making the same dumb mistakes that people make before. And if, if I've learned anything from you know, watching the, the media and even talking to my kids, they don't teach history like they should or, or like they do. So I really appreciate you being on the show. Well, those of us who are old enough to have lived through history and can still remember it, <laughs> at least can remind younger people, you know, we tried this stuff. I'll tell you one lesson I've learned though. I get kids come up and they say, why don't we do X for some right. value of X, right? And I'll think, you know, we tried X 25 years ago and it didn't work. Then I have to remind myself there's a reason why it didn't work. And maybe things have changed, parameters are different, power is, you know, less power is needed, higher speed is available, more memory is available. Maybe X would work. And so I've had to rethink a lot of things as a result of hanging out with a lot of younger people at Google. And Vint, you're not here to just crush the dreams of the the, the young folk, right? right. <laughs> Some of those big ideas that came to fruition, there was probably a whole bunch of people that at some point in time said it wasn't possible. And you were one of the dreamers that, that kind of brought these ideas along and made them happen. So uh, Dreaming is a good thing. We should encourage it. Right. Well, thank you so much for joining us here on the 6.5, on the road. Everybody, you just got to see, hear, and listen to someone that made a really meaningful contribution to your history. Probably the fact that you're watching this right now has a little something to do with some of the invention. And of course, all that playing, streaming, socializing, and other media that you are doing has been built on the backbone of the internet. And by the way, while you're on the internet, hit that subscribe button. We'd love that you joined us here at Google Cloud Next 22 at Pier 57 in New York City. Lovely place, lovely day, lots of great news. Tune in for more episodes. We'll see you all soon. Bye-bye now. See you on the net.